everyone sees things differently. We all have a perspective that's personal. We have a way of looking at things. We have a way of relating to things. We have a intercourse with things that are involved in our lives. Whether it be our wives, our children, our jobs, our place of residence, where we live, where we walk, where we talk. The very fact that we breathe in air and breathe out carbon dioxide means that we have an interaction with our environment. We see things differently because we have a different perspective. And two people could be in the same place at the same time and see completely different things. We say in the teachings about the Holy Spirit that the Bible being a spiritual book it's up to the Spirit of God to give revelation or to unveil or to make obvious in some way our understanding of what the Bible says. That's why two people could read the same part of a scripture and come up with completely different ideas or completely different understanding based upon A, the Holy Spirit, what He may be teaching them at that time, and B, their personal perspective on how they see it. That's why Jesus made an interesting comment that I find fascinating all the time because it really involves you and I and how we look at somebody that disagrees with us. For instance, you know, if you run into someone who says, it's not the way I see it, what do you say? Well, let me tell you how I see it. And then you get into your perspective and depending upon your patience, depending upon your attitude, depending upon your reason for having this conversation, you may develop an attitude about, I'm right, you're wrong, or you may be discussions of how a person from their perspective may see it and how you see it from your perspective. And it doesn't mean that there has to be a meeting of the minds. You see, one of the interesting things that's happened in just a court of law is that it used to be that in our judiciary system, people would automatically say, hey, if you've got two or three witnesses, hey, that's, that's a fact. The facts are established by the witnesses that have given an eyewitness account. Then we began to discover on cross-examination, when people look at things, they may not always see everything they thought they saw. And while sometimes cross-examinations are used in a negative way, it also brought out an interesting fact that not everybody sees things the same way. For instance, you know, one man's hoodie, as we have a famous case right now that is being prosecuted and still being argued about, one man's hoodie may be a stylish effect, you know, where he's kind of looking cool, you know, and he thinks he's really, you know, shuffling and huffling and being kind of neat. Maybe another man's threat because he's covering up something and he's hiding his face. And so, Everybody sees things differently, and we call that profiling nowadays. Profiling is a term that we're used in order to take some information and based upon some previous experience, cause us to look at and be influenced by something we see. And that's why everybody has a different perspective. Depending upon where you're coming from and what you're looking at and why you're looking at it, you're going to get a different perspective on it. You're going to see it from a different point of view. God knows that. God said that. God said, hey, you know, there were people at the foot of Mount Sinai even, when he revealed himself, when God Almighty came down to earth and said, I will reveal myself. And he comes down at the mountain and Moses goes up the mountain with Joshua. Joshua stays about halfway. Moses keeps going. The people hear the voice of thunder. They see thunder, although I don't understand that one. They see the lightning. They hear God, and they're terrified. Some heard the voice of God. Some saw thunder and lightning. Some only heard thunder. We're even told in the Gospels the same thing happened when Jesus was being baptized. Some heard thunder, but others heard the voice of God speaking and saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Some saw a dove coming down. Others didn't see anything at all. Paul knocked off his horse. The same thing happened. The, the ones with him saw a great light. Paul was blinded, but he saw the Lord. And so 
different people get different perspectives by way of their experiences and sometimes that influences them in a good way and sometimes it can influence you in a bad way how do you keep that perspective correct how do you look at things will determine often what you're going to get out of it life as we're living it today is all about perspective believe it or not from the end of the book we're told something very interesting you go to the book of Revelation and it means perspective. No, really, think about this for a minute. Get a handle on this if you can. The book of Revelation is a book of perspective. It's all about seeing things from a different point of view. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him. See, God gave to Jesus the revelation. That's kind of interesting. You know, when you get really down to it, it's like, ooh, Wow, huh. It's kind of like a play on words there. But the point is God unveiled and says, Hey, check it out. Here's my son. That's what the revelation of Jesus Christ means. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to reveal to his servants, you know, the prophets and, well, to us, to the those that were in Asia Minor and all the churches and to us today. And in so doing, he revealed or gave us a perspective to look at something and to see something that we would not have seen before, that we didn't know about Jesus. It was something that would also reveal about the end of the world and about life in general. That there was more to life than just what we think we see on the surface and what we think we know every day as we go through life. God never intended you to come up with your own conclusions. He always wanted to give you wisdom about what you were seeing. He wanted to take you through your day today, right now, in this moment that you're living, and he wanted you to look at things from a different point of view. He wanted you to begin to see things with his perspective. Because he can reveal things that we can't see. And that's what he did in the book of Revelation. He revealed things to Jesus, but he also revealed things to the church, and he reveals things to us even now as we look into that book as well as the entire Bible. We set our mind on the things above so that we would see things that maybe we hadn't thought of before. If we ask God to open our eyes, as one song used to sing, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, then you would see things from a different point of view, maybe from God's, if he so chooses to reveal it to you. But you see, if you don't open your eyes, if you don't have... God revealing things to you, then you're looking at things not really necessarily accurately. You might be seeing things from your point of view, your perspective, and it might influence you in the way you look at things. God is love, so his perspective starts from and ends with love, whether you understand that or not, with all the process of all the different nations that have been judged and condemned or whatever it may be that you kind of think of the Old Testament as being, oh, a God of wrath and the New Testament is a God of love. No, it was a God of mercy and truth all the way through. Righteous and true are your ways, O Lord our God. And so his love was manifested in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, which is obvious when you see Moses or you see Abraham and they're talking to God and you read that conversation and you realize, well, that's loving, not condemning. You know, and God extends his mercy. You know, it's like, hey, you know, you want 50? Fine, I give you 50. You, know, you want 20? Fine, I give you 20. You want 10? I give you 10. And still he saved them. I mean, God should have wiped them out because there weren't 10. That's the way I look at it. He was merciful. And so, seeing things from his perspective, although we can't completely understand how he sees things, is different than from our perspective. The best we can do is to really take a second look, you know, to look a little closer, to maybe examine closely what we're looking at. I know today I, I look at, you know, my outside my window in the morning. First thing I do, I get up in the morning, I have to head to the kitchen, you know, because I'm hungry. <laughs> no, but I head to the kitchen, and looking outside my window, I see construction going on. There's some remodeling going on from a fire that had happened at our apartment complex. And every day there's construction happening, except on weekends, but they're building. Now they're building one step at a time. Now I see, you know, one part being done, and it's like, wow, that's kind of cool. 
And then I see another part being done, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Or I see a delivery coming with wood, and oh, that's kind of cool. And step by step, I begin to see how the pieces come together to fit for the construction, and how boards are cut, how things are assembled, how the, the walls are being placed, how the pillars, or the pillars, the posts for the porch are being planted, and how things are beginning to be connected and interconnected, and how they relate to each other, and how they begin to come together, how even different construction people, whether it be a framer, or a roofer, or electrician, or a plumber, comes together in order to assemble this project. That's what your life is, God's project. There used to be a song that was a children's song that says, I am God's project, I'm his love object, I am God's project, and he's not done with me. You know, and it goes on and on, and it was like kind of a cool, cool song. It was from, uh, I think, Music Machine, but I'm not sure. But for me, it was a truth. It was a fact. It was a reality that I'm a project that's on a long-term schedule. It's being evaluated as well as being renovated and being changed daily into what God wants me to be. And as I do, I begin to see how his workmanship is not the way I would do things. I would level the place, you know, wipe myself out and start all over again. Because I know where I've been. <laughs> but that's not how God works. You see, God looks at my life and says, I'm doing it. I can use it. This is how I do it. This is how we do it. You know, and God chooses to renovate and to reconstruct that which we normally would have destructed or in some way, um, I keep forgetting this word that I talk about in construction all the time, and I know the word, but I just can't think of it. Demolition. We would demolish the building and wipe it out and start all over again. Where God says, no, hey, you know what, I'm just going to cut this off here, cut that off here, I'll take that and you know, move that, and, you know, I'll put spirit in them, and you know, it'll be fine. And we're like, really? And that's what a plan and God's plan is in your life. It's something that God can see that you can't, that he's got a construction plan and purpose and design and what he's going to do with you. And he's causing those things in your life to happen to bring you to that place of being renovated, remodeled, so that he could live inside. Because you see, that's what happens when you remodel and your life is being changed from day to day into what God wants it to be. He wants to live in you. Now, there's some things in you that aren't so good. So he's got to, you know, kind of like take them out. And just like asbestos, you know, like I saw the removal of asbestos. You know, asbestos was a good idea at the time. It seemed like a good idea. It felt like a good idea. And then later we found out it wasn't such a good idea. And because we only thought of it as a good idea at the time, at the time it was left. But once you start to have problems with it, you have to remove it and take it out. It requires some special equipment, some special suits and things that need to be done in order to seal it up and get it out of there because it's man-made. It was something that God intended for a different purpose, but man used it for something that should not have been done because it would cause health issues and health problems, and it would kill you. And that's what happens in your life. There are lots of things that seem like a good idea at the time. Seem like, wow, that's powerful. You know, they're good insulation. And so you, you know, involve it in your life, you get involved with it, and what happens to your life is you wind up dying from it. It kills you, or it slowly kills you, or it infects you with something that's going to kill you. And so, God has to remove that from your life. And for some of you, there may be lots of things that God has to remove from your life. Because He wants to inhabit you. He wants to be inside you. He wants to fill you with His Holy Spirit. He wants you to know him. And that's what he really wants is to have a roommate, you know. He wants to come and habitate with you. He wants you, just like Jesus was filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, he wants you to have a habitation with him. And to prepare you for that, he's taking a lot of time, slowly, daily, step by step, to make you a fit habitation for his presence. For him to be in you day and night and night and day. And that may take a lot of reconstruction. Some 
destruction of some of the things that maybe weren't such a good idea that you involved in your life. And that's what your life is all about. It's not about yesterday's glory, or it's not about tomorrow's future, but it's about today, the project you're in. You're involved in a reconstruction project that has a deadline that will be met because it has been promised and it has been assured that the company that's working on you, God our Father, as the architect, with the, his way of working with many workers, the plumbers and the, the electricians and the construction people, are going to be giving you a makeover so that you'll be dumbfounded when they move the bus, as it used to be in the television program, or when they unveil, as it were in the book of Revelation, the fullness of what Jesus really is and who he is, or when you open your eyes and God opens your eyes to see a lot clearer what you couldn't see before, or when finally you put on your glasses because your eyesight isn't so good as it used to be. Then you notice things a little differently. You put on these glasses that cause things to come into focus and you go, ah. And then as the construction project continues on in your life, you begin to see how the walls take shape or the the beams are arranged in such a way that there can be another platform put on top, which we call the undercoating for the roofing. And then the roofing can be put on it. How it begins to make sense. Because at first it doesn't. You look at something that's being built and you wonder, well, how are they going to do that? When are they going to do that? What's happening? And so your curiosity gets you, you know, and you kind of wonder, well, what's going on? And that's what the Christian life is like most of the time. Well, what's going on, Lord? And God's got a project in mind. You know, He's got the long term, you know, final deadline. And you have no idea when that is. But in the meantime, things begin to come together and you kind of see how he's working in you to change you so that you would be that habitation that he can live in. And as you do, you'll find that you want to let go of some of the old ways that you used to do things. It's kind of like, you know, I've watched people tell me, well, you know, there's this new fangled instrument, you know, that you, know, you can do a hundred nails, you know, in an hour. And it's like, well, cool, you know, and that's great, you know. And a guy that's organized and skilled and in a hurry puts a hundred nail or a hundred nails in a minute or whatever, you know, and uses a nail gun and just smacks them all down and <laughs> fires them off. Sometimes, you know, if he's skilled, you know, it's a very quality project. Sometimes we find out down the road that maybe he missed a spot or two because he wasn't really that focused in. He was in a hurry, and while he may have had the opportunity to shoot a hundred nails into a board, you know, or into that project that he's working on, whether it's roofing or whether it's, you know, the, the framework or the flooring or the walls, you don't really need that. You know, there's an old style and an old statement that used to say, what you put your hands on has your imprint. And sometimes craftsmen choose to use old ways to perform positive new ways of functioning. There may be new ways of putting things together, but sometimes the old ways work better than what we come up with in technology. I know there's prefabrications, you know, and we see a lot of prefabricated homes and houses that, while they look good, while they sound good, while they seem like they're good, you know, kind of like mobile homes, you know, or prefab houses. We slap them together and we throw them up and then down the road, you see, they don't last so long. They don't seem to stand up through time. Now, I noticed this house that, you know, or this apartment complex is being kind of uh, remodeled. You see, it was built back in the old days, so to speak, uh, during a military time and it was kind of like military housing. And it was built with a different perspective. It had some pretty heavy-duty beams in it. And you know, those heavy-duty beams took a fire. And they pretty much survived. I would have captured those beams and used them, believe me. I mean, they, they'd replace them. But I would have you know, kind of like sanded them down a little bit. And man, those beams were good. 
And it was amazing because the fire was huge and it consumed a lot of things, but a lot was left behind. So the house, though it had been and suffered great loss, was able to be remodeled into something that God could use. And that blew me away because the construction was built right. And a lot of times you'll see that about some people's lives. Somebody in their past, like maybe a grandmother or a mother, may have been praying for or talking to or even laying a foundation in their children that you don't see it at first. And you don't know it until their life begins to fall apart. And then suddenly, you know, it looks like there's no hope left for that person. And then the reality comes in. God says, oh, watch me. And he brings in the plumbers. And he brings in the, the construction people. He brings in the engineers. And he says, this is what I can do. Do you want me to do it? And he asks you that today. Look at your life. Are you happy? Are you content with what's going on in your life? Are you thrilled with the way that your life has proceeded? Do you have, you know, like what you wanted, you know, that brand new car and then suddenly it got a scratch down the side because somebody took a key and just scratched it and now you got to pay money to buff it out? Are you thrilled with some of the things that you've done in your life? You know, are you wondering if there's even a purpose to your life anymore? Or have you decided that maybe you need a renovation? Maybe you need to rethink your choices to reconsider what your life is all about. Are you desiring, are you wanting to see more enjoyment in your life? Or are you just wanting to spend your time spinning your wheels, trying to move from place to place, always moving, always running, always seeking some other thrill to fill that emptiness inside, having to find another job, another wife, another life, another person, another thing, another thrill-seeking adventure? Are you always after that hype rather than that hope in what God wants to do with you? Life is going to shake, break, and maybe destroy your house. Jesus said it in a different way, but basically it boils down to the same idea of when the big bad wolf came and huff and puff and blow your house down with little piggies, your house is going to be challenged by life. Eventually, sooner or later, whether you keep your job or lose your job, whether you have a great foundation or you have a lousy construction project going on, your life is going to reveal a lot about what was done in your life. And if your home gets destroyed, like flooded or wiped out or falls off a cliff, then you might consider where your foundation was and what was wrong in your life. But before that happens, you could look at the architect of life, the person who designed all of this, who had a plan from the beginning and a purpose for every single event, every single occasion in your life, every single step that you have been living from day to day to day. God he is an architect of life. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, but he's also the person who created the universe. He put the stars in the heaven. He put the sun in the sky. He put the moon there. He put the planets and the seasons in place so that we would have time. He made time. We didn't. We just observed what was there and recognized what God said, and we discovered time. It had always been there. God had said it. <clears throat> but it was for us, not for him. So, when you're looking at time, or you're looking at the seasons, or you look at your life, or you look at the things that are going on in your life, your perspective might be pretty messed up. Because you don't see it from the grand master plan, the big scale, the project, the community that God has created for the universe to be. And you're a part of that, whether for good or for bad, whether you're going to be refuse or you're going to be used or whether you're going to be, unfortunately, demolition. Because even demolition has a purpose. If you've ever seen, sometimes when they're building highways, they'll take rock and crush it, smash it to bits, destroy the rocks that God created and lay them down 
underneath some asphalt or cement so that they can make roads to be trampled under by man. That's what the salt is when Jesus was talking about if the salt has lost its savor, it's no good for anything except to be trodden under man. Your life was never meant to be just something that everyone could abuse or use. Your life was not meant to be crushed and destroyed and annihilated in a demolition project with which you become trodden under man and destroyed by the things and circumstances of life that are going to hit you. Whether disease, whether job changes, whether nation changes, whether the end of the world which is coming soon, or whether just your own stupidity. God intended you to be rather a renovation project that he wants to construct in you and deconstruct some of your bad planning, your major construction foibles, some of the places where you aren't up to code and you need to have that examined by a code inspector and say, ah, you know, this is going to cause a fire down the road. We need to take that kind of tubing out and put in some better prepared, better designed, structurally sound electrical wiring so that it will last for generations and not just a temporary fix. It won't be loose wiring that should something happen like water damage or bugs invade or some rot or a fire and it winds up killing you because that's what's going to happen. Your house could kill you. Your own body could destroy you. You could wind up finding out that on the other side of death still is life. Unfortunately, your house has been torn down and you're unhoused and now you're standing before God naked. I like my construction project God has me in. He's taking me from my tent and building a mansion for me. He's taking me from this kind of like, you know, dead badger skins on the outside of me. You know, this kind of skin you see, you know, and the tabernacle that I have been inhabiting. And though I have lived in it for a long time and I've enjoyed it and God's presence has come in, He wants me to have something more than what I've gotten comfortable with. I've been out in the wilderness, in the desert, you know, traveling a long time with my tent, my tabernacle. In this tabernacle, I've gone through a lot of experiences. But He wants me to have something more permanent, more enduring than a temple in Jerusalem. He wants me to have an eternal capability of being with Him always conscious of him every ways and being able to see him in everything and in every way that I move and have my being to be at one atonement with God to be open to this reality I won't even understand till I get there I like that it's kind of like a sci-fi housing event you know I'm looking forward to that new release of the new Star Trek movie that's going to have not some star performing some acting and you know hoping for something that we go wow and ooh and ah but I'm going to be the main attraction I'm going to be Captain Kirk I'm going to be the star of the show and so are you you're going to have a completely new way of looking at the universe you're going to go where no man has gone before <laughs> literally because you'll have a body equipped for the universe and there'll be things that you'll see and abilities you'll be able to do that you have no idea or imagined before. Because this isn't all there is. And if you think there is, hey, you're living in a dump compared to what's going on up there. And that's why God wants you to take a different look. Take a different perspective. Step back for a minute. Take a look around you and look at creation and then imagine the universe. That's how far away you're supposed to be from where you are today. That out there is where you're going. This down here is where you've been. And where you get there is renovation by God. He wants to change you. He wants to rearrange you. He wants you to understand that this is not your life. This is not your home. This is all passing away. Everything is going to dissolve soon. You won't. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We spend our lives 
and our years as a tale that is told. The days of our year are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet it is their strength of labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I am the Lord. I change not. Our conversation and citizenship is in heaven, from which we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned into his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. When I watch that construction project, like I said, every day that I get up and see the progress it's made, I'm thrilled. I think, cool. Somebody's going to live in there soon. Somebody's going to move in. Somebody's going to make it their own. Somebody's going to adapt to this new housing that has been made for them and they're going to enjoy it. Kind of like what I've done here. You see, that's what God wants you to do in your life. He wants you to allow Him to move in with you as a roommate, but He wants you to take part of your life and make it a planting of the Lord, to rejoice in the things He's provided for you, to be thankful for what God has given you, to discover and uncover what an abundant life really is, not the amount of monies or things that you get attached to or attach themselves to, like asbestos, you know, sidewall and you know things that are going to kill you in the long run, or rot, wood rot, or you know, all kinds of things that happen, you know, inside of housing, mold, mildew, you know, some of those gases that you can't even see, you know, that kill you in the long run. God's construction project doesn't kill you. It gives you life. You find that you begin to sustain a better life, a mature life, a growing life, a life that was in designed and purposed to be in eternity with Him. Maybe that doesn't mean much to you right now. Maybe your perspective is, hey, you're fine. Maybe you're glorying in your newfound job, your new car, your new wife your children, your grandchildren. Maybe you think everything's going on smooth sailing and everything's just hunky-dory. You got your church or you got your your Bible study down, you know, and you kind of like, you know, you know, I'm okay. You know, it's like, I appreciate what you're saying there, Michael, but, you know, don't go too far here, you know. After all, you've been talking a long time. Well, I got news for you. There's a fire coming. It's going to happen. salvation. First John determined it, said it from the very beginning. I could lie to you and tell you all the different scriptures that says, by faith you believe and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He is not the son of God. Has not life. The bottom line isn't the faith part. The bottom line is you know because you talk to him. You know because you walk with him. You know because you have a relationship with him. But if you don't, you don't. And that's how you know. You do, then you do. If you don't, then you don't. Ask God immediately, if you don't have that kind of relationship, to start building a reconstruction project in you. Ask Him to habitate with you. Ask Him to 
live in you. Ask him to come and move in as a roommate in your life. Ask him to possess you and dispossess yourself of all your vanities so that there's room for him to move in. Sometimes you got to clean out the old storage chest in order to make room for someone who's moving in. And that someone is God. It's time for you to get rid of the things that are in God's way and let God construct in you a life that's worth living, a life that's worth giving, a one mansion that God has designed from the very beginning of creation for you to have in this life as well as a place and a habitation in New Jerusalem to come equipped for the universe. Besides, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've been looking at your life, you know, and it's like you're living in a tent. You could be living in so much more. Let's put aside the tent life, the tabernacle. Let's give up these, you know, temples we're building, you know, that we think are so important, you know, that, oh, wow, look at our structure. Look at our new building. Or let's get a building fund going. Or let's build bigger and better. I'd rather deconstruct those things that are vanity and reconstruct in our lives the reality of God. That He is in us, Emmanuel, and that He is living with us as a, not just a roommate, but as our primary person we decided to marry for the rest of our lives. That we are in that relationship with Him. That He is our God and we are His people.